All right, so we're working towards being able to build a hydraulic fracture simulator, at least in 1D. And last time we met, we derived this equation, uh, which is basically the conservation mass of fluid in the fracture um, combined with the relationship between the internal pressure and the width through this elastic response function, which is that matrix A. And, uh, and so basically the, the product of the matrix A with the width gives you the pressure. And so then that term is a finite difference discretization of the pressure gradient. And when you do that, then it puts the whole equation in terms of width. It's something we can solve for width, okay? Um, we used, you know, we talked about finite differences and we used a central difference approximation um, for the first derivatives. So the width cubed there, the pressure gradient. And then here we had a second derivative in pressure, and so we used a central difference uh, second order approximation uh, for this term here. Okay. And it's one of the reasons I sort of haven't assigned the actual final homework yet because I wanted to work through all the subtleties myself so that, because uh, as I said earlier, it's going to be hard enough without you know, you get tripping you guys up with some subtlety. Uh, so, when I looked at this, I uh, was working it myself, you know, ultimately we're going to model our fracture as a fit, fixed height discretization, right, where we're basically going to break our fracture up into little blocks. And then each of these points, so this over here represents the well, and this over here represents, um, you know, the reservoir in which we're propagating the fracture into. So the fracture is going to move in this direction. Uh, and the way it's going to move is through you know, basically through the displacement discontinuities, if we compute the width uh, such that the, the displacement discontinuity, which is the width, exceeds, uh, we, when we evaluate the fracture toughness, it, that exceeds the, <coughs> when we evaluate the stress intensity factor, if that exceeds the fracture toughness of the material, we're going to add an element. We're going to add an element, we're going to add an element, and that's how the fracture is going to grow in this direction. Um, but as I was looking at our equation up there, you know, based on the, the differencing approximation we used, uh, I started to look at it and I said, well, you know, here, here we have a well. We're trying to solve for the width, right? And, you know, that, equa that represents an equation for the ith grid block, for the ith grid block. Well, in the, in the event that the ith grid block is this one, right? So if we number these, one, two, three, four, and five. So in the event that we're talking about i equals one and we want to write that equation, if you look at that first differencing approximation up there, we have i minus one, right? So that would be a grid block in the well. It doesn't exist. Now, depending on what we're doing, we can implement, uh, you know, th this essentially is some sort of boundary condition. Right? It's the width of the fracture at the well. But that's something we don't know. We want to solve for that. So the, 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 the choice of differencing discretization sort of causes a problem. And, and I didn't foresee it myself because I don't really use finite differences. I'm a finite element guy. And I wouldn't have this problem with finite elements. Um, but here, you know, I'm forced to need to know what the width is at some imaginary grid block that's right there. And it's a result of the choice of my differencing approximation. Now, even, the, you know, the, the width at the well is something I want to solve for. Over here on this side, the width in the reservoir is a boundary condition in a way. It's something I know. What is it? It's zero, 
There's no fracture there. There's no fracture. So what I can do is just change my differencing approximation. So we used the central difference beca because we wanted the accuracy. Remember I told you on Friday that whenever you do numerical methods, you're always training speed for stability for accuracy. Okay? And maybe I should have also said another trade-off is in ease of implement. You know, this is something that's not talked about very often but is an ease of implementation and readability of the code. If you have a choice between making your code 1% faster or making it 50% more readable, you should always choose 50% more readable. Because you want to write code. I mean, coding is sort of an art form. It's sort of like painting a picture in a way. I mean, there's a lot of weird things you can do. And there's not always one correct way. And whenever you write code, you, you want to write code that's easily readable and extensible, especially if you're if this is a real code you're, you're going to work on a team with, you're going to do something like that. You want, your, you want your colleagues to be able to read your code. And so you can do really fancy, really sort of esoteric stuff in code. That's usually not the right way to do it. And so what we're going to do here for, in, in, you know, especially for this class, in terms of where I think ease of implementation for you guys is one of the most important things. We're going to give up some accuracy. And it's not really accuracy, but let's say convergence rate. I mean, if you remember, the central difference approximation had an error that's on the order of x squared. So as I reduce x, the error reduces quadratically. I'm going to give that up. We're going to go back to a forward difference approximation that has an error on the order of x. Now, the error still will be reduced as I reduce the size of these grid blocks. It's just going to be reduced at a slower rate. Okay. So I'm going to give up some accuracy for ease of imp implementation. And you'll see what, what happens when I do that. So if I just go back up here and I change my forward difference approximation, I mean, my central difference approximation to a forward one. So remember, in a forward difference approximation, I have it's i plus 1 minus i, so get rid of that. And then it's just over delta x, not 2 rep delta x. Okay, so now I have a forward, now I have a forward difference approximation. So now I don't need this imaginary grid block over here. Okay, it's not a problem. Because if I'm writing it for the ith grid block, the i plus 1 grid block is 2, and the ith grid block is 1. Now over here, I still have a problem. Because if I'm on the if I'm on the end, the last sort of element that exists in the fracture, I want to solve for the width here, but I need to know what the width is there. But I do know it's zero. This is in the reservoir. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a sort of imaginary grid block there, or sometimes they call them ghost cell. So we're literally going to include sort of a ghosted sixth gr grid block. But the thing is, we know what the width is there. It's zero. And so then I can still use my forward difference approximation. OK? Now also, so I, I gave up some accuracy because I reduced, I reduced the, um, you know, I made the error larger, essentially. I also gave up some speed when I did this. Because now I've got to do a computation over a grid block that doesn't really exist. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just for ease of implementation. Right? So I'm doing, a, I'm doing a computation over a grid block that I don't really need. Now, the, the, you know, the benefit is, it's, it's, at this point, it's just one. Right? And it will always be just one. Even if I reduce, you know, even if I refine this such that my five grid blocks turn into 5,000, it's still, at this moment, just one on the end. Right? So it's not like I'm increasing the computational cost a, a tremendous amount. But it, but it is a little bit that, uh, true. OK? Now, still have another problem, because I still have this second derivative thing. Right? And so this was a. a Central difference approximation for the second derivative. And uh, 
uh, we can do a forward difference approximation there too. Now we didn't derive the equations, but I can just all I have to do is just increment the ith indice by one. So I'm just going to add one to the ith indice. So that's going to become i plus two, uh, i plus one i. So it's going to become i plus two. Plus one I because right. because I, I still had that I minus one over here if I left it like it was but now I have an I plus two which again is going to cause a problem here because I added one grid block so I need to add one more. But I know the width is also, you know, the width here is zero, the width there is also zero. So I've got to add one more sort of ghosted grid block. And that's it. I mean, so I'll, ha I'll always have these sort of two ghosted grid blocks hanging out on the end. But where I'll s specify that the width is zero, and then I can, and then I can use my equation. As it is. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It, that's the same as the first, right? So it ju we're just going to switch from central difference to forward difference. So we're going to go i plus 1 and i delta x. Okay. So again, there was nothing wrong with the first equation. It was also correct. It just caused me, in, in, this, in an implementation sense, it caused me trouble here in the, in the well. I mean, so, so we're going to switch to that. Now, 